I'm just going to look at one verse here this morning, and we'll go from there. <clears throat> Joshua 24, and verse number 15. Joshua is speaking to <clears throat> Israel is in the, the promised land, getting established and built up and getting some, some encouragement or some preaching, if you will, even from, from Joshua. But Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, he says this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your fathers that uh, fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We ask your blessing upon the service here this morning. We pray that you would be glorified and honored. Lord, we pray that the truth here would be a help, that it would draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray that uh, what, what we see here in these principles of, uh, of following you, Lord, I pray that you would... Uh, give us the wisdom and the discipline to put them into our lives. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, I do pray for their salvation. I pray your conviction upon them, that drawing, Lord. I pray the truth of the gospel will be clear. Lord, please bless and work. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, one of the greatest things I think I've enjoyed in life and the different things, positions, or responsibility I've, I've held is that of a dad. Um, of becoming a dad. I remember when, when Daniel was born, going all the way back to 1991. I was 21 years old. It was March 28th, and uh, I went into work that evening of March 27th, and I think I was working 11 o'clock to about 7 or 8 that morning. I was on midnights, and uh, I don't know, it was probably right around midnight or so. I got a call. I got a, actually, I was, I, was at work, I was out on the flight line at the time, and to stand by an F-15, and then the, the dispatcher called on the radio and said I needed to come back to the shop, and I went back, and Marianne was in labor. She was already at the hospital, and so I had, I had headed out, went right to the hospital, and it was just a couple hours later, I think it was about 1.50 or 2.50 in the morning, when Daniel was born. And I still remember that experience. I do think we have to go back when the father should not be in that room. I'll never forget that being in the room during that time. It's much better to be in the waiting room and just wait and let them come and tell you what happened in that room. And, uh, but anyhow, I remember when Daniel was born, though, it was, it was, I still remember holding him. Marianne had held him first, and then, I, then just a, a minute into it, I, I had taken Daniel. And just knowing that my life changed that day, I knew things were different. You know, it was amazing looking. I could see myself in him. I could already see, you know, a mix between me and Marianne as I looked at his face and just that sense of awe. I mean, I was young at the time, again, only 21 years old when the first one was born. And then the same was true pretty much for all of the, all of the children um, after that. You're just in awe when each one was born. Now, I, I did handle the birth, birthing process better. By the time we got to Bethany, she was born here in 1996, in June of 96. Her birthday was yesterday. And that was at the hospital in Elmendorf Air Force but, Air Force Base where she was born. I was excited when Marianne went into labor. I didn't know it that day. That's, it was a Saturday afternoon and that Marianne went into labor. I headed to the hospital. And of course, we didn't have a, we had a television put up. We'd watch some, some, you know, videos or stuff like that from time to time, but that was it. And well, they had a television in a room and ESPN was on with a baseball game. I was like, yes, this is great. And so it was a much different atmosphere by the time the fourth child was there. And, uh, <laughs> I was kind still. I was. She, you know, I was, I was there for her. Um, and all that I do while she's in labor and all that great effort that I have to put in. And, uh, but nonetheless, my life certainly had changed. You know, I was excited and I was nervous. And again, that was the same for each of the children when they were born. And fatherhood is, again, it's one of the th greatest things about life. It's one of the greatest responsibilities that a man can have as being a dad. The statistics of what happens when a kid is, when a child is raised in a home where dad is not present are staggering. 71% of high school dropouts come from homes that are fatherless. 71%. <clears throat> as well as it's the exact same percentage, 71% of pregnant teenagers come from a home where a father is not present. Of children who have behavior disorders, 85% come from homes where dad is not present. Of the homeless and runaway children, that stat is 90% dad is not present. 
60% of youth suicides, dad is not present in the home. Of the youth who are in prison, 85% dad was not in the home. Again, just staggering. One of the reasons why the devil, we know the devil wants to destroy the home, and one of his biggest targets will always be the parents. If he can get to dad or if he can get to mom, some way to get in there and get dad out of the home. The role of both the father and mother is critical. It's how God designed it to work. Again, in those, it's getting, it's getting you know, as, as we're moving on, post-World War II, 90% of children grew up with both parents in the home up to at least the majority of their teenage years, up to 17, 18 years old. That was a 90% statistic. It wasn't too long that that had dropped. It was about 30 years later, 30 to 40 years later, where that had dropped to about 67% grew up. And that's where dad's at home the entire time, where he's there. He's present during the childhood. That dropped to 67%. But fathers not only need to be in the home, they need to be involved in the shaping of their children for the Lord. We certainly need fathers to rise to that challenge. We see in our text right here, Joshua, as he's trying to encourage Israel to do right, he recognized the dangers that were out there. And, and he's, trying to get him to, he's trying to make just simply a logical argument on who God is. He's saying, listen, you figure out who's real and who isn't. He said, but if all that you have witnessed, of all that you've seen take place, and you know that God is real, that you're serving truth, that it isn't a fable, that it isn't made up, that, you actually, that you're not serving just some stone, that you're not serving some man-made idol, that you're just not walking around thinking, you know what, we just happened to be here. One day there was a really, really big explosion, and things just came into existence. But he's saying, listen, if you recognize that what you have is truth, and you see that it is God. He says, well, then choose you this day whom you're going to serve. If it is God, then serve him. Elijah made the same argument, didn't he, on Mount Carmel? He said, listen, how long halt you between two opinions? If God be God, if this is true, then serve him. And, of course, Joshua then put it in context, not as his position as a leader of Israel, but in his position in the home recognizing that was foundational for the nation of Israel, was the home. So I want to look at some examples from Joshua's life that led him to this conclusion, led him to be, no doubt, an excellent father. Why he was able to say that, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was a determination that he made. So first, let, let me look at some characteristics for his life here this morning. First off, his faith was demonstrated. He actually lived his faith. Let's see, there's a lot of examples, of course, I can go to with Joshua for this. But I'm going to go to Numbers 27. Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27 and verse 18. <clears throat> His faith certainly was demonstrated. He lived it. Verse, verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the... A man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. And it continues from there. This is the Lord instructing Moses of who is succeeding him. It's going to be Joshua. So when the Lord looked down upon the children of Israel, there was something he saw in the life of Joshua. He said, this is going to be the man to succeed Moses. This is the one that's going to have the responsibility of bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. The one that's going to carry the burdens of the nation. The, the, you know, we know everything that Moses dealt with. And Joshua's going to deal with the same issues. And yet the Lord looked down and saw something in Joshua. Listen, in whom the Spirit is, you're going to put your hand on him. He's taking your place. It was Joshua. See, the Lord knew that this was a man that did not play a game with his faith. He lived it. He lived his faith. 
It wasn't just something on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning or, you know, it was something that he lived every day. I certainly think it's important that as fathers, you live your faith before your family, that it's not just something they see when you come to church. Do they need to see the discipline of church attendance? Of course they do. But boy, if they see something else different at home, do you know how damaging that is? Joshua lived his faith. He lived it. What kind of spirit would your children say you have? The Lord recognized in Joshua was a godly one. It was the one that, he, that God wanted to use. So if we were to ask your children, dads, what kind of spirit does dad have? What would they say is most important in your life? Joshua demonstrated character and integrity before the Lord and before his family. We all know character counts before the Lord. It's what he looks at. He wants to see the integrity. He wants to see the character. Our homes certainly do need men of character. The fact is, dads, what your children need to see much more than a large bank account and a nice house is a dad of integrity and character following the Lord. They need to see a dad who lives their faith. Secondly, look over in Joshua chapter 6. Not only was he, he was a man, number one, that lived his faith, he demonstrated faith by how he lived. Joshua chapter 6, just a couple of verses here. We know the story, so I'm just going to, for time's sake, just cover a couple of verses, starting in verse 2. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. I like how the Lord starts off this charge to Jericho. The battle isn't won yet, but he says, I've given it to you. It's, it's over with. <clears throat> verse 3. It says, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. This is the game plan on how to attack Jericho. The Lord is giving it directly to him. He, he said, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and seven priests shall bear the ark, uh, um, and seven priests shall, be, uh, shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And I shall come to pass, and they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So here is the game plan before the Lord. Here it is. He goes to Joshua. He says, listen, the city is yours, and here's how you're going to win it. You're just going to march around six days. The seventh day, you're going to march around seven times. You're going to have the ark going before with, with uh, seven priests, with seven horns. And after that seventh time, you march around on the seventh day. You're going to blow that horn, and everybody's going to shout. And the walls of the most well-defended city in the promised land are going to crumble right before you. That was it. You know what Joshua did as we, let, as we read on? He did exactly what the Lord told him to do. You don't see an argument from him. You don't see him coming back, but wait, a, how exactly is this going to work, God? I don't understand. That never takes place. If we read on, he does exactly what the Lord told him. So the point being in his life that I want to draw from examples in Joshua's life for this one is this. He was disciplined to the point of obedience. He had that discipline about himself in his Christian life, in his Christian walk. Even when he was faced with something that he did not understand how it would work, he had enough discipline in place to be obedient. See, sometimes we have a measure of obedience in place until something we don't understand or it challenges the way that we're walking. And then we begin to dismiss it or justify disobedience. And know what? Your children see that. They see there's like, there's like a line drawn in your service to God as to how obedient we're going to be. With Joshua, you don't even see him challenging, not, not even asking a question when something he clearly didn't understand was going to take place. Again, he was walking by faith. He was obedient to the Lord even if he didn't understand. 
Again, too often our children see us justify some measure of disobedience because we think we know how it should be done. What will impress your children is when you are obedient, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it means there's a change in the family. Where they can see and understand and and recognize as a child that dad and mom just put God first. And listen, this is very true. The majority of the time in families, children follow the faith of their fathers, not the mothers. The level of faith. Number three, look what he did here. Joshua chapter 4. Go back two chapters. Joshua chapter 4. He was disciplined in his life. He had this measure of obedience. Joshua chapter 4, starting in verse 4. They have crossed the Jordan River. The Lord dried it up, not dissimilar to what happened with the Red Sea, just on a smaller scale. And now, verse 3 says, um, Take ye twelve men out of, uh, out of the people of every tribe of man, and command them, saying, Take ye out hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in a lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared um, of the children of Israel out of every tribe uh, of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man a stone, and upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then shall you answer them, The waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So we have this memorial that is set up. Joshua wanted a memorial set up for the children to ask their dads what God did. When they saw these stones, it was was story time. They were saying, listen, I want to tell you what God did here. They knew by the, by, by, by the, just by standing up these stones, even if they're busy, a child, you know, you think of a child, six or seven year old, is going to ask, Dad, why are these stones here? Then they can sit down and tell exactly what God did. Listen, in your family, set up those memorials or put something in place in your home at different places, whether it's a picture on the wall, something on a nightstand, where it's something that God did in your life. You know, something that's much more important than those degrees and those awards hanging up in your house. It's not so much that your children need to see what great things you have done. It's not about your narcissism. It's about what God did in your life. It's about establishing things in place there where your child can remember, this is what God did. It had nothing to do with dad's strength or dad's power. It was simply because of dad's faith and and what God did in his strength. That's what they need to see where God worked in the family. Set up those memorials. Again, New Guinea, we had that one built-in forest that, that I loved. And the timing of it for the years that we were there always just, especially when we left, especially the month that we left New Guinea amazed me. And that was, again, we were there four or five months. You, you've heard the story. We're driving down. I'm on a supply run. I'm just with a, a two of the men from down in the Namatanai area that are helping me from the work in Sohong. Uh, that uh, was going. And so we had, I had two men with me. That was it. We're driving down the road and my hood flew off. You smacked the windshield. So I pull over and we literally found rope and we tie my hood back down onto the truck. And remember, the road's very, very rough in that little island. And so we're, we're taking off again. I'm doing about 50 miles an hour again. We finally got to the sealed road. The last, again, the last hour was a sealed road. So I'm doing about 50 miles an hour. There's usually no other cars around at all. And, I, and, and something doesn't quite feel right, and the vehicle changed levels. It dropped down, and the steering wheel's on the other side there. And I look over here by the passenger side, and I'm seeing sparks and, and fire just going like this out. The vehicle is incredibly hard to control. And then we see, all of us saw my entire wheel flying through the air, the whole wheel, the front wheel of the passenger side. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It was going above the coconut trees. Boom. Launching. We're just staring at it, going down the road, trying to control the car, and, and it comes to a stop. And now we pray. We should have prayed at the, at the hood when the hood flew off, but we didn't. This isn't five minutes later, and a tire flew off the car. And so before we left, we, we said, we, we need to pray. 
So we prayed in the car, we get out, and my stomach's in knots, I want to throw up, I don't know where I'm at, I'm nowhere close, there's no, there's no tow truck company, there's no way to call back to Mary, I'm like, all right, how many days, or am I going to be here a week, and Mary's not going to know what happened to me, and that could happen, she would know to be, there might be times I might not show up for a few days, and, and so I'm just sick to my stomach, we're going in, we're trying to find the tire, it already got stolen, by the way, in the meantime, we're in this village, it was already stolen, we did get it back, it was stolen just like that. And uh, a guide walked up, though, right after he got out of the car. His eyes are all big. He had seen what had happened. And we're right, I am stopped. My vehicle stopped right at the entrance. There's this little bush house on this side of the road. It's a narrow road. And on the other side, there's another, uh, another house in this village. And we get out working on it. And he, he talks to us. We start talking. The first thing he said, do you know where you stopped? I don't know where I am. I have no idea. None of us did. And uh, the two men with me were not from the island either. Asa was from the Highlands, and of course, Brother James Abino was originally from Port Moresby. And he said, this is a tire shop. You stopped at a tire shop. There's a couple of them on the island, a bush tire shop. I'm not five feet from it. I'm at the entrance of it. And so, anyhow, we found the tire, got on, we took one of those starts, I don't know what they call them here, you know, the, the, the bolts that hold your tire and off of all the other tires. You know, it wasn't long, probably 20 minutes, I'm back on the road and, and heading up to Cavian. But what was interesting is this, the memorial was set in place. The, where the tire flew off, I gouged the sealed road all the way till we stopped. And so you see the gouge going down the road, I don't remember what it was, it's, you know, 20, 30 yards long or so, and it stops right at the tire shop. You better believe almost every time we went down, you know what we all remember? We pointed to that right there. It was a memorial set up for something that God did to remember. Put those things up in your house. You should even think as a family, dad, mom, sit down and say, all right, what is something where God's did special? Well, put a, do something. Put a picture up of it. Buy a knickknack to remind them so they can ask, what's this about? Again, that's much more important that your children see what God did in your life than the own, your own accolades that have come about in your life. Set up a memorial. In our text verse, so number three, he, he made, he set up a memorial unto the Lord. He was disciplined to the point of obedience. Um, let's, in Joshua 24, 15, in our text verse, we see that he decided with this determination that he and his family would serve the Lord. In other words, he determined it. It wasn't a question. He said, we will serve the Lord. That's what was going to take place in the house. He made that decision. In other words, one, we learned several things in this. One, he he determined that he would be the spiritual leader of his home. That's what he was going to be. He was actually going to lead. It wasn't going to be a passive role to Joshua. It wasn't just going to be expected to happen because the Levite was going to come around every now and then. He was going to be active in his position as the spiritual leader of the home. Dads, that's important. Be active as the spiritual leader in your home. Be that priest in your home. The fact is, if you're not leading your children, who will? Again, the fact is, this world has a lot of dangerous things about it. There's a lot of things out there that would like to grab for for your child's attention. Many fathers, even Christian fathers I'm talking about, in church don't necessarily make that conscious decision to lead their family to serve God. If you don't determine you're going to do this, it will not happen. You want them to see the most important thing in life, Dad, is the Lord. Be that leader in your house. You say, well, that's just not my, that's just not my personality. Yeah, it really... It, It's about denying self, using a measure of discipline to see the need that is there. What all is at stake? And God will give the wisdom and strength for it. Again, your children should see that the most important thing in life is the Lord, that life is all about God. It's not going to help your children if through your life all they learn is, is the importance of money. Listen, they need to learn financial responsibility. Me and Levi have been going over stuff of that here, here in, in the past week as he started working more and earning more income. So we've had a lot of lessons you know, going over financial responsibility. 
But much more than learning financial responsibility, he needs to see the importance of God. It really doesn't matter to me if he's out of the will of God and has the greatest job on the planet with a great retirement. I would be heartbroken. Again, it doesn't help your children if they see what's most important in dad's life is the promotion at work or the next raise. They need to see that it's the Lord. Again, two loves that will always, always help your children is they need to see that you love God and that you love their mother. That will help them all the days of their life. Two more. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And Joshua, the son of Nun, it's too bad he didn't have parents. Those dad jokes, you get it? That's pretty good. Dad joke, that's all right. All right, back to serious now. <clears throat> and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, when, uh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is not with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the, and the glory of, of the Lord appeared in a tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Interesting here what takes place. You see, there's, there's something here that we learn about the life of Joshua. He was diligent in keeping his eyes on God and not on circumstances. Diligent about that. I mean, really, one of two. If we, we're not going to go, for time's sake, we're not going there, but in chapter 13, to read this in context, we'd have to read a good portion of chapter 13. And chapter 13 is when the Lord gave the instruction, you know, they, they had the instruction, Moses sends out the 12 men to spy out the land. They head out there. Everything's going great. They got the grapes. It's going to be great for crops. They can see it. They're excited. But then what happens? They see the wall cities. They see the Anakins. And when they saw the Anakins, now, I mean, they, they knew they were going to have battles. But they didn't realize they were going to have to face the Anakins, the giants that were there. I mean, these were huge men. And they thought, there's no way we can do this. And, and, but two men, of course, Joshua and Caleb, they didn't change. I, I mean, they're still jumping up. They're still excited. They understand, listen, God's even going to deliver them into our hands. And they were the only two that recognized the benefit of having the Anakins there. If all the battles were easy, what would the world recognize? The Lord always puts us in places to where we face battles when people look back and they say, Wow. That could not have been of them. If the Anakins aren't there, that doesn't happen. Two men recognized it. Joshua and Caleb. That was it. Too often we just look for the easiest road instead of the road of faith. But Joshua, even in the midst of this, even when he saw the Anakins, he determined to keep his eyes on God. As, as they're speaking here. As they're addressing the nation. They said, listen. They, they tore their clothes. They said, listen to us. We got this. This isn't a problem. If the Lord's directed us, if he's in this, this is not a problem. We will win. Listen, Dad, you're the one that needs to be telling your child when they're facing, especially when they get into those teen years. Once they start hitting 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, it's going to come so important to let them know, hey, you got this. You know, encourage them to stay close to God, to stay with it. You got this. It's all right. Giving him wisdom and guidance through it. Listen, you need that. You need to be able to recognize those times in your life, and even allowing the nature of your relationship to change with them as they get older. When they're 18, they're no longer six years old. Do you understand that? It's allowing God to give you the wisdom to develop that relationship, to guide them in truth.
You let them know as they grow up that as long as they are serving God and following his promises, they got this. Lastly, something about his defense. His faith, what I like about Joshua, was not based what everyone else was doing, but what was right. But what was right. That was Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he's letting them know, too, if all of you decide you're going to serve the God of the Amorites, I'm not changing. If that becomes the cool thing here in Israel, that we're going to go into idolatry, I'm not changing. He did not base his parenting skills on what others were doing. He based it on principles that were scriptural. I mean, times are changing. Again, at times I see parents making decisions that scare me. Even though it's becoming commonplace for different things to take place and allowed in the home, I'm not changing. I don't want those dangers in my kid's life. Yes, but it's everywhere now. I'm not changing it. I'm not going to base how I raise my, my, my children on what's expedient. I'm going to raise them based on principle. You make decisions based on what is right, not what is popular. And by the way, if you love them and you handle it with the right heart, it's not the battle that you think it is. It's not. We certainly need God's wisdom and his help. We need to be able to have that wisdom to make sure in an ever-changing world, an ever-changing culture, that the decisions we make for our children are based upon Bible principles and not just simply what's expedient or what the culture is now doing. Joshua certainly is a great example for us to follow. I mean, when he, de- when he, I mean, that verse, by the way, that's a verse we had out. Was it still out there posted, Michael? Joshua 24, 15. We had it out there for years. It was like the theme verse of the camp about choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My guess is probably about 30% of us have that somewhere in our house hanging up. That very verse, somewhere in the house. That's good. But we have to live it. We have to understand what got Joshua to that point. That even as, notice, again, think of that dad's, in in his position as a leader of Israel. He's still in this last last push to the nation. He put it back to the scale of his family. He was a man who demonstrated and lived his faith. It wasn't a game to him. He kept his eyes on the Lord even when circumstances were so tempting to take his eyes off of God. He kept his eyes on the Lord. He did things based upon principle, not what might be popular in the culture at the time. He lived it. That's what he did. And this course just isn't for dads. This is for all of us as we serve God. All of us. But as dads, if we have these things in place, remember what we said before God, when God looked at him, looked at Joshua. He said, I know the spirit that's in him. That's the man. See, that's what God's looking for. Where he knows when he guides and directs, you're going to respond to that based upon that character and that integrity. Listen, God will honor that. We all need God's grace and strength in our home. There's not a perfect parent in here. We've all made really bad mistakes. But as you're trying to follow the Lord, man, that grace that he has, the wisdom that he still gives. He can turn situations around for something that the devil was using for evil and make it to strengthen the family. But you got to seek him. you got to determine as Joshua, this is what I'm going to do. Let let me finish with this. I left the book over here. I want to finish with this. It's an old, old book of poems, actually. I'm going to read this, and and then we're going to head into a time of invitation after I do this. But I'm going to read this poem. A verse that was given to it with with this was Luke 15, 20. When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
Of course, that's the prodigal son when he's returning. Let me read the poem. It says, Father, today I bring to thee this boy. It's in, a, in, it's in a, a form of a prayer. Father, today I bring to thee this boy of mine whom thou hast made. In everything he looks to me, in, in turn I look to thee for aid. He knows not that all that all He knows not all that is before. He little dreams of hidden snares. He holds my hand, and o'er and o'er I find myself beset with fears. Father, as this boy looks up to me for guidance and my help implores. I bring him now in prayer to thee. He trusts my strength. I trust yours. Hold thou my hand as I hold his, and so guide that I may guide. Teach me, Lord, that I may teach, and keep me free from foolish pride. Help me to hide this boy of mine, to be to him a father true. Hold, hold me, Lord, for everything, as fast I hold my boy for you. We certainly need prayers like that before God for his wisdom, his strength, and the responsibility that he has given us as dads. With heads bowed and eyes closed. This message was for dads. But there's certainly something else I want to bring up as we go.